Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. When I look back at what it is that grew the passion that I have for ministry leaders and the the care and the concern that has since grown it, and I didn't even know that it was really happening back then. I really didn't. But when I'm thinking back as to why it is I'm called to do this very thing, it has to do with a church plant that failed. And I wasn't part of that church plant, but the planter was a friend of mine, someone who had greatly encouraged me in ministry or to step into ministry because I was as they say, second career to ministry. I used to work in the marketing, PR, and advertising realm where I owned my own agency. And then I felt a call to ministry. But this church planter friend had a failure. This is in the era a while, quite a while ago. This will probably date me a little, but they were doing parachute drops where they would put a planter into a community where they knew nothing and nobody, and they would say, we're going to plant a church here. Now, you know, fast forward to today, and there's demographic things that you could know. There's other tools that weren't even available then. It just was the planter would say, I have a heart for XYZ community. I feel God wants me to plant a church there. And they would drop them in town with, sometimes they were funded by a denominational group. Sometimes they were funded by individuals. Sometimes they were funded by their own team that they had gathered. So this particular planter had waved the white flag on what was going down there and It was not sustainable. They had given it their all, you know. I mean, you go at these things, you're all charged up, you're ready to to do this, you form your team. It's a lot of steps involved, but still, you know, you're you're working from the ground up. And I hats off to I have other church planter friends who were greatly successful at this. There's a lot of variables here and there's not too many parachute drops in operation today, I think. The, the thinking is it's, it's shifted to some other models that are more sustainable. But what happened is everything just stopped and this church planter was just done. And I reached out to them and, and said, hey, how are you doing? And they put on the brave face, you know, as we all do, speaking in gracious terms about everybody and everything all around them, yada, yada, yada. And I came away even from that conversation with my heart just broken for this person. They uh, gave it their all, gave it their best, prayerfully so, and it just didn't work out. And I thought of the picture to me came to this. I saw a parachute drop and the treatment of church planters in particular. I mean, any ministry leader knows this kind of thing because, you know, we've all made the sausage. We've helped to make the sausage. We've seen the sausage be made, all of that kind of thing. And I came to see it like this, that basically that church planting process was more like, you know, your denomination or supporters or whomever it took you to the end of a pier of some very, very deep water and and chucked you in there and then waited for a bit and said, hey, can you swim? How's it going out there? Invariably, if the plant was not successful, the planter couldn't swim. And so they would pull them out of the water. But who is there really to resuscitate them after the fact? Who is there to help put them together after the fact, after they had given their all and just felt completely like a failure, demoralized, less of a a ministry leader, maybe smitten by God. I mean, who knows? You could probably, they 
things going through anyone's mind after a ministry failure is as varied as anything else. I, you know, there's lots of reasons, lots of rationales for why and how. So I looked at that whole process and thought, man, that's kind of mean. <laughs> really, really mean. And I began to gather a sympathy for those in ministry. I mean, even at that particular moment, when I was still fairly new to my call, you know, and like I've said before, I think if naivete was a sin, I would be burning somewhere terrifically much because I was still early in the call years. But I had had friends that were in ministry and they had talked quite a bit about their frustrations. It doesn't take ministry leaders long to get into their frustrations, even when they gather together. And, you know, I had one pastor friend say to me, but how do you get them to want to do Bible study? How do you get them to want to do... I said, you just have to set that buffet. You know, if if they, this is a a contemporary Christian song, I'm sure. If they choose to go eat a candy bar in the corner instead of the healthy stuff on the table, you have to be faithful and obedient and set the table. I mean, I've seen pastors just chewed up one side down the other when they were placed in a church congregation, a ministry setting where they chewed up leaders. That's kind of just what they did there. I've seen pastors burnt out. I've been a pastor burnt out. I led a merger of four and a half congregations south of Detroit. We worshiped in a school for four years, which is really weird in the ranks of the United Methodist Church, at least up here in the Rust Belt. It was weird because we've been a little slower with planting efforts and revitalization efforts than, than some other conferences have been. I led this group of four and a half churches to then purchase some property. What we did was all of the buildings were sold, you know, because there was a heavy market for, you know, cruddy, ill-kept church buildings. No, not really. It was a very slow real estate market at that time. So we had to wait quite a while to sell them all and then pool those assets and purchase. We did purchase a 13,000 shell of a building, square foot shell of a building south of Detroit, on 10 acres, which was kind of unusual in the downriver area. So then we had to do a renovation because the building was left down to the studs. There was both a flood and a fire in the building that we purchased. Structurally, it was sound, but boy, and this is a side, if I had pastored a group and there was a flood and a fire in the building, I would have assumed God wanted me to just sit down and be quiet. But anyway, We purchased this building. We did this major renovation in it with our funds. We had to secure additional funding to make it be the kind of building we needed it to be. And that was a whole ordeal of a process, very much so. And then we were required to have a capital campaign while we were doing the building process. At the same time, we're trying to do a community needs survey. And I said to my supervisor, this is kind of a lot, a lot, lot. Anyway, you know, I was assured that this was for a short period of time. And, you know, sometimes that's true. Sometimes it is just for a short duration and you've got to, you know, pedal to the metal to get a group to go where they need to go next. But truth be told, you know, I was frying and dying on the inside. I was, when I stepped back from that role, I was, you know, pretty toasty toasty, toasty. And I was offered another congregation to work with to help them get a solid foundation on which the Lord would want to build and to work with them. And I was flattered by that. They gave me or they offered me a three-month paid sabbatical. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty generous. But my comment back to my supervisors was, well, What happens if after three months, I'm still not all put together inside? And they said, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And I said, but I have friends. I have friends that have taken a three-month sabbatical, more than one. And when they came back, it was maybe seven days back, and they were right back to where they were before they went on sabbatical. And I was told, well, they just didn't do their sabbatical right, which is 
probably not a good thing to say to me because then I'm pondering, well, how do you do a sabbatical wrong and how do you do it right? And it, it just, so that was my final, I got to step back from this because I just had a feeling and it did take me more time than three months to get myself back in order. So, you know, I, I guess I had to live it too, you know, instead of just watching others be challenged, other ministry leaders just tired, overwhelmed. And all of this, all of what I'm saying to you is even before COVID hit, I have sat back many times and thought, wow, you know, just from what I saw, from what I experienced, from what my heart told me about what pastors and ministry leaders are all feeling and going through has only escalated from that moment. And I guess I can look at everybody, every one of you here that's listening and say, you know, are you feeling like you've been tossed into a big body of water that's very deep and and somebody's hollering, so, hey, can you swim? How's it going out there? And I think the water today is pretty choppy, pretty choppy. And maybe some of you need to get out of the water because you're tired of treading. Maybe some of you are swallowing that water. Maybe some of you are just floating and and just doing what you can do to float and maintain. And I guess where I want to go with this Krabby Pastor podcast is to say to you, I'd like to offer, I would really like to offer you a life vest, a life vest that I believe that God is leading me to offer and that through me then, God is offering that to you so that you know that somebody is on the side hoping to give some resuscitation, hoping to give some relief, hoping to provide you with some skills and tools and insights into how to be sustainable in ministry in such a way so that you don't become the crabby pastor. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for considering what it looks like to be the crabby pastor. And my hope and prayer would be that you would be doing everything that you need to do to not be the crabby pastor.